Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, by Carol Quigley. Chapter 15, Closing in on Japan, 1943 to 1945. When Germany surrendered on May 8, 1945, Japan was already defeated, but could not make itself accept unconditional surrender, and was trying to stave off that inevitable end by suicide tactics. In the 35 months, from the Battle of Midway to the German surrender, the Japanese Navy and Merchant Marine had been swept from the Western Pacific and largely destroyed in the process, cutting their home islands off from vital overseas supplies and leaving millions of their armed forces isolated in Southeast Asia, China, New Guinea, the Philippines, and other island pockets. The war against Germany and the war against Japan were separate wars, although involving the same victorious nations. Weapons, strategy, and tactics were quite different, chiefly because one was a war of air and land, while the other was a struggle of naval and air forces over an immense ocean. Even American strategic bombing was different in the Pacific, using B-29s, unknown in Europe, for area bombing of civilians in cities, something we disapproved of in Europe. The great weapons against Japan were the aircraft carriers, which relentlessly prowled the ocean and provided the necessary protection for amphibious assaults on the island stepping stones, which led to Japan. The total destruction of the Japanese Navy and Air Force were almost incidental to this process of protecting landing forces of Marines and Army units. Even where the same weapons were used in the European and Pacific struggles, the outcomes were different. In the former, the German submarines were hunted down and destroyed. While in the Pacific, American submarines made a great contribution to victory by the almost total annihilation of the Japanese merchant fleet. Japan's minimal need for merchant shipping to keep its civilian population from starvation was about 2 million tons. It had started the war with 6 million tons, added 3.5 million tons during the war from building and capture of foreign vessels, but had 8.2 million tons sunk during the war and finally surrendered with only 231 vessels of 860,936 tons still able to operate. Of the loss, 5.1 million tons were sunk by submarines, 2.3 million by aircraft, and 0.3 million by mines. By the spring of 1945, Japanese merchant shipping was already below its minimum civilian survival level. Immediately after Midway, the vital issue of the United States became the need to stop the Japanese advance against Australia in the southwestern Pacific. At that time, the southern edge of the Japanese defense perimeter ran east and west through New Guinea, just north of Australia. Its advanced base was Rabul on New Britain Island, taken from Australia in January 1942. This base, a magnificent but remote harbor 3,000 miles from Tokyo, was linked to the Japanese capital by two fortified bases, which had been constructed illegally in the Japanese mandated islands. About 800 miles north of Rabul was Truk in the Caroline Islands, and almost 700 miles north of Truk was Saipan in the Marianas Islands. From Saipan, later, a B-29 base for bombing Tokyo, it was almost 1,600 miles to the Japanese capital. Just before Midway, the Japanese extended their threat 600 miles farther south from Rabul, southwest to New Guinea thus threatening Australia, and southeast to Guadalcanal, the southernmost of the Solomon Islands, 2,375 miles north of Wellington, New Zealand. The American counterattack to this Japanese southward push took the form of two parallel thrusts northward, passing to the east and west of Rabul and Truk. The western thrust, under General MacArthur, aimed to reconquer New Guinea, and move northward through the Admiralty Islands and the Philippines to the China Sea. The eastern American thrust, under naval control, sought to go northward through the Solomon Islands, then bypass Rabul and Truk 
far to the east through the Marshall Islands, returning to the Tokyo Road by attacking the Marianas from the Marshall Islands, 700 miles east of Truk. This double movement is usually referred to as a ladder, in which alternative advances on either side by the Americans led to Japanese counterattacks from Rabel and Truk between the two legs. At first, much of the fighting was piecemeal, with inadequate supplies for both sides. But American supplies continued to come, while Japanese support was much more intermittent. This eventually became the story of the Pacific War, as American supplies, delivered from 6,000 or more miles away, buried the Japanese beneath water and earth. This struggle northward from Australia and New Zealand was to have been accompanied by a third thrust under General Joseph W. Stilwell and Lord Louis Mountbatten from India across Burma to re-establish connections with southwestern China. For some time it was expected that MacArthur and Stilwell, converging on China from the Philippines and Burma, would establish a mainland base from which the final assault on Japan could be made. The Burma campaign, held up by the difficulties of the terrain and constant diversion of men and supplies to other theaters, did not reach China over the hand-built Burma Road until February 1945. MacArthur was held up for two years, 1942 to 1944, in the New Guinea area. Thus, we must focus our attention on the eastern drive from New Zealand northward through the Solomons. This eastern drive began on August 7, 1942, when Guadalcanal was invaded by naval and marine forces from Wellington, New Zealand, 2,375 miles farther south. By February 8, 1943, after six months of horrible jungle combat, often without air or sea support, the Solomons were conquered. Six drawn naval battles during the struggle greatly weakened the enemy surface forces, while his air forces were crippled. In the same period, Japanese advance bases were expelled from the Aleutian Islands, and at least 135,000 enemy ground forces were left isolated in New Guinea and Rabaul. By the autumn of 1943, the Allied forces had reached the Great Barrier of the Japanese-mandated islands in the Central Pacific. These were passed in a series of amphibious operations called Island Hopping. The first of these, Tarawa, in the Gilbert Archipelago, was a small operation in comparison with subsequent landings, but its name still brings horror to those who remember it. In four days, 3,100 Marines were torn to pieces, a third fatally to capture a small coral island defended by 2,700 Japanese with 2,000 civilian laborers. The fanaticism of the Japanese was a revelation and may be measured by the fact that 4,500 were killed. We learned a great deal about amphibious warfare at Tarawa, especially the need for thorough preliminary naval bombardment and for detailed knowledge and planning in regards to tides, winds, reefs, and local fire support. In February 1943, this experience was applied at Kawa Jalin, the world's largest atoll, 560 miles north of Tarawa, and at Inaiwitok, 340 miles west of Kawa Jalin, in the Marshall Islands. In these landings, Americans had their first large-scale experience of the irrationalities of fighting Japanese. Officers of the Mikaido attacked tanks with ornamental swords, while privates sometimes killed themselves when they had Americans at their mercy. But usually, they fought skillfully and tenaciously, until the outcome was hopeless, when they made suicidal bonsai charges. These two landings cost 695 American dead to kill 11,556 Japanese. During these operations, Admiral Raymond Spruance led a carrier task force in a strike on truck, which destroyed over 200 Japanese planes and a dozen naval vessels at a cost of 17 American aircraft. In the course of 1943, the American advance up the right leg of the Pacific Ladder to Tokyo 
got so far ahead of schedule that several projected landings were eliminated. All future landings were advanced in date by a couple of months, and the whole weight of the advance was shifted from its original project of a final assault on Japan from Formosa, or the Asiatic mainland, to an undated and specific amphibious attack from Pacific bases. This left three major problems. One, the need for an island close enough to Japan for preliminary bombardment by land-based planes. Two, the possibility of very large American casualties when the Japanese invasion came off, possibly in 1946, and three, what could be done about the millions of Japanese ground forces in northern China and in Manchuria. The last two of these problems led to efforts to obtain Soviet intervention in the war against Japan. They meant, almost certainly, that considerable concessions must be made to the Russians in the Far East, and that the final assault on Japan must be left until several months after the final defeat of Germany, to allow Soviet forces to be shifted from Europe to the Far East. In the meantime, the need for an air base for land-based bombers within range of Japan resulted in the conquest of the Marianas Islands. The Marianas were 700 miles north of Truk, over 1,000 miles north of Inaiwitok, and almost 1,600 miles from Tokyo. The conquest of Saipan in the middle of this archipelago in June and July 1944 was the second greatest amphibious landing that summer. Two marine divisions under Lieutenant General Holland M. Smith hitting the beach at Saipan on June 15th, only nine days after D-Day in Normandy. The Japanese had 29,000 men on Saipan, 7,000 on Tinian, and 18,000 on Guam. All three were eliminated by the end of July. Japanese resistance was so intense on Saipan that an American army division held in reserve at sea for the other islands had to be thrown ashore at Saipan on the second day. That island was conquered by July 9th, with 27,000 of the Japanese garrison of 32,000 killed, two 3,400 Americans dead, and 13,000 wounded. Over 24,000 Japanese and 2,214 Americans were killed on the other two islands. Efforts by the Japanese fleet to disrupt the Marianas attack led to the Battle of the Philippines Sea. June 19th through the 20th, 1944. This was another naval battle in which no surface vessels fired upon or even saw each other, since it was fought entirely in the air and under the surface. On the opening day, the Japanese lost 402 planes, while destroying 26 American planes, and two of their carriers were sunk by American submarines. As the Japanese fleet, denuded of air protection, fled westward, Spruance's planes pursued and sank a carrier and several lesser vessels at a cost of 20 planes. This engagement shattered the Japanese naval air support and left the Philippines open to American assault. In September 1944, another amphibious attack landed in the Palau group of the Western Caroline Islands, 1,175 miles directly west of Truk and only 610 miles directly east of Mindiano, the large southern island of the Philippines. Feverish haste was made to conquer this group and to prepare Ulithiato the best harbor in the area, as a base for American surface vessels. Since the invasion of Leti in the Philippines had been moved up from December 20th to October 20th, only four weeks after the occupation of Ulithi on September 23rd, the invasion forces of two divisions had left Hawaii on September 15th with their original destination at Jap, just south of Ulithi, but were diverted to rendezvous with two divisions from MacArthur at sea, 450 miles east of Leti. In the meantime, in the first half of 1944, the Japanese fleet shifted from the inland sea of Japan 
to Linga Roads off Singapore in order to be closer to a supply of fuel oil. And the Japanese army on the mainland of China drove southward from Hankou to Hanoi, Indochina, cutting Chiang Kai-shek off from all eastern China and overrunning the American strategic bombing bases in the area. On July 27th, President Roosevelt, Admiral Chester Nimitz, and General MacArthur, meeting at Pearl Harbor, decided to speed up the assault on Japan, to recapture the Philippines without awaiting the defeat of Germany, and to force Japan to accept our terms of surrender by the use of sea and air power without an invasion of the Japanese homeland. On September 13th, Admiral William F. Helsey suggested cancellation of four projected intermediate landings and use of these troops for the immediate seizure of Leyte. The suggestion conveyed to Roosevelt and Churchill at the Second Quebec Octagon Conference was approved and ordered within 90 minutes, September 15, 1944. The Palau landing began the same day. Both the time and place of the American landing at Leti were anticipated in Tokyo, but the Japanese were unable to reinforce the single division on the spot. To cover the landing, Admiral Helsey led the third fleet of nine fleet carriers, eight escort carriers, six battleships, 14 cruisers, and 58 destroyers to pound the Ryukyu Islands, Formosa, and Luzon, October 10th through the 17th. 1944. With over 1,000 American planes in the air at a time, this force destroyed 915 enemy planes and hundreds of naval vessels. Since Japanese naval planes had been critically reduced in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, and since most of these destroyed and Helsey's sweep were land-based, the Japanese were critically short of trained pilots after October 17th and began to adopt kamikaze suicide tactics. In these tactics, half-trained pilots dived their planes, loaded with bombs, onto the decks of the American ships. These new tactics inflicted severe losses on the Americans in the next few months. In the week of October 17th through the 24th, Helsey's third fleet was back off Leyte to cover the invasion force of 732 ships. In five days, 132,400 men and 200,000 tons of supplies were landed against only moderate opposition. To destroy this landing, the Japanese gave orders which resulted in the Battle of Leyte, the largest naval conflict in history. The eastern shore of the Philippines may be regarded as two very large islands, Luzon on the north and Mindiano to the south. Separated by a cluster of smaller islands, the Visayas, which include almost contiguous Samar and Leyte on the eastern shore. Between Luzon and Samar was San Bernardino Strait, while further south, Leyte and Mindiano were separated by Surigao Strait. The Japanese plan was to send a small force as bait from Japan to entice Helsey's third fleet northeast from Luzon, while three other Japanese forces, one from Japan, and two from Singapore, would secretly approach from the west, with the center force under Admiral Takao Kurita passing through San Bernardino Strait, and the southern force under Admirals Kiyohide Shima and Soji Nishimura passing through Suriago Strait to converge on Admiral Frederick C. Sherman's 7th Fleet to destroy both it and the Leyte beachhead before Helsey could return from his northern pursuit of Admiral Jisaburo Usawa's sacrificial bait. These plans, requiring precise timing and ruthless execution, failed only because the quality of American fighting men was so superior to that of Japanese admirals that it overcame Japanese superiority in guns and ships in actual combat. The resulting Battle of Leyte ended the Japanese Navy as an effective fighting force. On one side were 216 American and two Australian ships, with 143,668 men, plus many auxiliary vessels, while the enemy had 64 major ships manned 
by 42,800 Japanese. The Japanese Northern Force was made up of two heavy, one large, and three small carriers, which could no longer be used as carriers because of lack of naval aviators. These six vessels, escorted by three light cruisers and eight destroyers, sailed down from Japan to entice Bull Helsey's third fleet, with almost all the American heavy striking power, northward away from the Leyte landing. Unexpectedly, it escaped observation until October 24th, a day later than expected, and had to sail in circles waiting for Helsey to come north. In the meantime, Curita's center force, which hoped to remain undetected, had been intercepted by American submarines and reported. This Japanese force, headed for San Bernardino Strait, had seven battleships, including the two largest in the world of 68,000 tons, with 18.1-inch guns, 11 heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 19 destroyers. All these major vessels were faster and heavier than comparable American ships, but had little air cover, poor fire control, and inferior morale. On October 23rd, the American submarines Darter and Dace torpedoed three of Curita's heavy cruisers, sinking two, including Curita's flagship. While Curita was being rescued from the water and dried out, Helsey, warned by Darter, sent an airstrike over the top of the Philippines and sank the 68,000-ton battleship Musashi with 19 torpedoes and 17 bomb hits, and also knocked out a heavy cruiser. Hours earlier, Japanese land planes from Luzon made a strike at Helsey and were mostly destroyed, but a single bomb, exploding in the carrier Princeton's bakery, set a fire which ignited its torpedoes and aviation gasoline, and blew it apart, inflicting heavy casualties on the cruiser Birmingham, which had come to the rescue. When Helsey's planes, returning from west of the Philippines, gave exaggerated reports on the damage to Curita and announced that he had turned westward, Helsey took off with 65 ships, including all his heavy vessels, northward to where Osawa's bait of 17 ships was patiently circling. Curita, seven hours behind schedule, resumed his course to San Bernardino Strait and Leyte Gulf. In the meantime, two other Japanese forces were converging on Surigao Strait, far to the south. Together, they had two battleships, three heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and eight destroyers. Their approach was reported to the American 7th Fleet off Leyte. This moved southward to meet the threat at Surigao Strait, assuming that Helsey would continue to cover San Bernardino Strait. The intercepting force of Admiral Thomas Kincaid's 7th Fleet had six battleships, four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and 28 destroyers. As the Japanese southern force plowed through Surigao Strait, in the long, dark night of October 24 through the 25th, it was attacked by 30 PT boats. These were dispersed after great confusion. Then came more than a hundred torpedoes from American destroyers, scoring nine hits, which sank three Japanese destroyers and a battleship. Gunfire from the American heavy ships then sank most of the southern force. Damaged vessels were pursued by air and submarine until, by November 5th, only one cruiser and five destroyers of the whole force were still afloat. As the 7th Fleet disengaged from the remnants of the Southern Force at 5 a.m. on October 25th, the main Japanese force, under Kurita, 175 miles to the north, had emerged from San Bernardino Strait and was bearing down on Leyte, which was protected by a flotilla of six escort cruisers with a screen of seven destroyers under Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague. These small vessels were off Samar Island, with about 25 planes each, and were backed by two similar flotillas farther south. Surprise was complete on both sides. At 6.47 a.m., when a patrol plane discovered Curita's presence, the news had hardly registered 
when the Japanese big guns opened fire. Fortunately, Kurita was completely disconcerted by the encounter and believed he had run into Halsey's fleet. Sprague, under cover of smoke screens and rain squalls, tried to escape the heavy Japanese gunfire while holding the enemy out of Leyte Gulf by vigorous airstrikes from his baby flat tops and torpedo attacks from his destroyers. The Japanese shells of 5 to 10 16-inch caliber were all armor-piercing and went through the thin plates of Sprague's vessels without exploding. But with up to 40 holes each, these ships were soon leaking freely. They attacked so vigorously, however, using their 5-inch guns when all torpedoes were gone, that Kurita's fleet was scattered and he decided to withdraw to regroup his forces. He had sunk two American destroyers, an escort carrier, and a destroyer escort, but lost three heavy cruisers in return. By this time, 9.15 a.m., air attacks were beginning to come in from all over the Philippines, and Curita had received news that only one destroyer had survived, the Southern Forces' defeat at Surigao. He began to withdraw through San Bernardino Strait. Sprague's escort carriers were much cut up and still under heavy pounding from the earliest kamikaze attacks. These sank St. Lo, an escort carrier, about 11.30. At 8.45 a.m., urgent appeals to Admiral Helsey had detached a force of five fast carriers with escort vessels to pursue Corita. Two hours later, while still 335 miles away, these launched a series of airstrikes, 147 planes in all, of which 14 were lost without significant damage to the Japanese. The following day, strikes of 257 planes sank another of Kurita's cruisers. During this same eventful October 25th, Admiral Osawa's northern force, the Bait, had been swallowed. In five air attacks totaling 527 planes, Helsey's carriers, commanded by Admiral Mitchter, sank four Japanese carriers and a destroyer. Among these was the last of the six carriers which had attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Battle of Leyte, strategically ill-advised from the Japanese point of view, ended its navy as a significant force in the Pacific. From that date, the American advance was held up chiefly by suicide tactics, the kamikaze attacks. Leyte is of great historical significance as the last naval battle in which battleships participated and played a role, admittedly minor. The Third Fleet's battle line of six great ships did not even fire its heavy guns. While General MacArthur and the Army were clearing up the Philippines, capturing Manila after fierce house-to-house -house combat on March 14, 1945, the Navy and Air Arms pressed on toward Japan. By October 1, 1944, two intermediate targets had been set. One was to capture Iwo Jima in the Boning Islands, about halfway from Saipan to Tokyo, to be used as an emergency landing area and fighter plane base for the B-29s attacking Tokyo from Saipan. The other was to capture Okinawa and other islands in the Ryukus as bases for land forces to invade Japan itself. Iwo Jima was invaded on February 19th and secured by March 26th. Bitter fighting, which involved flushing Japanese one by one out of caves, yielded 20,703 Japanese killed and only 216 prisoners. By March 26th, 2,469 more, of which a third were killed, were disposed of in the next two months. The Americans lost about 5,000 killed, but three divisions suffered over two-thirds casualties in the struggle to capture this island of 4.5 by 2.5 miles. The dead on both sides thus amounted to 2,400 per square mile. Iwa will always be remembered for the famous raising of the American flag on the top of 550-foot Mount Siribachi at the southern tip of the island on February 23rd while fighting was still severe. On April 7th, the value of the island was shown when, for the first time, 
B-29s returning from Tokyo jolted down onto Iwa for relief. 54 landed that day. These big planes, flying the round trip from Saipan to Tokyo in about seven hours, were already engaged in systematic destruction of all Japanese cities. The flimsy houses of these crowded urban areas made them very vulnerable to incendiary bombs. But the distance was so great that only moderate-sized bomb loads could be carried. On March 9, 1945, the Air Force tried a daring experiment. The defensive armament was removed from 279 B-29s, releasing weight for additional incendiaries. And these planes, without guns, but carrying 1,900 tons of fire bombs, were sent on a low-level attack on Tokyo. The result was the most devastating air attack in all history. With the loss of only three planes, 16 square miles of central Tokyo were burned out. 250,000 houses were destroyed. Over a million persons were made homeless, and 84,793 were killed. This was more destructive than the first atomic bomb over Hiroshima five months later. The conquest of Okinawa was a much bigger task than Iwo Jima, 760 miles west of Iwa. It was only 360 miles from the Chinese mainland, and almost the same distance from both Formosa and Japan. It was 830 miles southwest of Tokyo Bay, a full 900 miles north of Leyte, and over 1,200 from the United States Navy's refuge in Ulithia Atoll. The size of the island almost 500 square miles, made it a possible staging area for an invasion of Japan. The magnitude of the assault on heavily populated Okinawa is almost beyond belief. The fighting navy of 110 combat vessels and over 100 supply ships protected an amphibious attack of 1,213 vessels, carrying 182,113 assault troops. The preliminary bombardment by naval guns fired 40,412 rounds in 16 to 5-inch calibers. The assault on a perfect Easter morning, April 1, 1945, hit the Coral Reef, with four divisions on a front five mile wide. The size of the whole operation may be judged from the fact that the supply tankers, in eight weeks to May 27th, delivered eight and three-fourth million barrels of fuel and oil and twenty-one and a half million gallons of aviation gasoline. In five of these weeks, the same tankers delivered over twenty-four million letters to men engaged in the attack. The Okinawa campaign was the most severe of the Pacific War. It required three months of intense combat to secure the island against the seventy-seven thousand Japanese defenders, most of whom had to be killed or committed suicide. The invasion force had 40,000 casualties, of which almost one-fifth were killed. The naval and air support suffered intensely from 1,900 kamikaze attacks, which sank 30 and damaged 368 naval vessels, with the loss of 763 fleet aircraft and with 10,000 naval casualties, of which half were killed. The degree and kind of resistance from the Japanese at Okinawa raised grave questions regarding the final defeat of Japan. By May 1945, a major part of the Japanese population was completely disillusioned with the war and eager to find a way out of it. These sentiments were shared by most of the civilian leaders and by a good portion of the naval leaders. Some of the army, however, still believed that they could make the costs of an American invasion of Japan too high to be acceptable to American opinion. Somewhat similar ideas occurred to some of the American leaders. These Japanese fanatics believed that they could get a major part of Japan's fighter plane construction dispersed and placed underground by mid-September 1945. If these facilities were used to build cheap, uninstrumented kamikaze planes manned by untrained suicide volunteers who were available in large numbers and supplemented by human torpedoes, it might be possible to inflict unbearable losses on any American invasion of Japan itself. As part of this project, the Japanese had perfected a manned glider bomb called Baka, 
foolish, by the Americans, which carried a man and 2,645 pounds of trinitral anisole in a 20-foot fuselage with 16.5-foot wingspan. Without any engine, but carrying three thrust rockets, this weapon was dropped from a conventional plane and came in on its target at over 600 miles per hour. Even with air cover and using proximity fuses, American ship defenses could be saturated and exhausted if enough of these came in over sufficiently extended periods. Several incidents in the Okinawa campaign raised fears of this nature. On April 16th, the destroyer Laffey sustained 22 attacks in 80 minutes and destroyed all of them. But six kamikazes hit the ship, knocking it out. On May 11th, the picket ship Hadley was attacked by ten planes simultaneously. All were destroyed, but the vessel was hit by a baka, a kamikaze, and a bomb, and was knocked out. Neither of these ships was sunk, but casualties were so heavy that American leaders shuddered to think of the results if such attacks were hurled at troop transports coming in on amphibious attack. In June 1945, American estimates of their casualties in such an attack were over half a million. It is true that Japan could have offered such resistance, for at mid-August 1945, when 2,550 kamikaze planes had been expended, the Japanese still had 5,350 left, with adequate pilots ready, and had about 5,000 planes for orthodox bombing attacks, plus about 7,000 more in storage or under repair. These, with bombs and gasoline, were being saved for the American invasion. These considerations form the background to the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, and the decision to use the atom bomb on Japan. The Conference of Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin held at Yalta in the Crimea on February 4th through the 12th, 1945, sought to reach agreement on most of the issues of the war and the immediate post-war period. The nature of this conference and its decisions had been so much distorted by partisan propaganda in recent years that it is difficult for any historian today to reconstruct the situation as it seemed at the time. In general, the conference seems to have been cordial, cooperative, and optimistic, and it is incorrect to project subsequent animosities and conflicts backward into the conference itself. As the discussion proceeded, the victorious armies were pressing forward rapidly into Germany in the Soviet offensive, which began on January 12, 1945, and Eisenhower's attack, which had begun on February 8, 1945. Victory could clearly be foreseen in the European war, but in the Far East the future was much more clouded. In Europe, the attitude of mutual trust seems to have been high, probably higher than the actual relationships of the three powers justified, but this was so prevalent that no efforts were made to establish limits of demarcation for the advancing armies within Germany. There was rapid agreement on joint post-war administration of Germany, with a four-power control commission to include France, and three separate zones of military occupation any zone for France to be taken out of the area assigned to the Western powers. Berlin, outside any zone, was to be governed jointly by a commandatura of commandants assigned by the respective zone commanders-in-chief. Access to Berlin as a military question and on the advice of the United States War Department was left to subsequent military arrangements with freedom of transit as the guiding principle. Differences regarding the rules of the United Nations organization were settled with surprising ease. Stalin accepted Roosevelt's suggestion that the members of the Security Council be unable to veto discussion of disputes involving themselves within the Council and the Anglo-Americans, in turn accepted the Soviet demand for extra seats in the Assembly by offering them two for the Ukraine and White Russia.
The crucial problem of Poland was subject to agreements which gave the Russians much of what they wanted. The Curzon Line of 1919 was accepted as its eastern frontier, but the western border was left indefinite, since Stalin would have placed it farther to the west, involving deportation of additional millions of German residents than either Roosevelt or Churchill considered acceptable. It was no longer possible to find a government for Poland. By fusion of the London Group with the communist-dominated Lublin Committee, since the former, after the resignation of Mikhailozik, had become openly anti-Soviet, and the latter, on December 31, 1944, had been recognized by Moscow as the government of Poland. Compromise was reached by agreement to expand the Lublin Group by the addition of democratic leaders from Poland abroad, and that this expanded government would be recognized when it had been pledged to the holding of free and unfettered elections as soon as possible on the basis of universal suffrage and secret ballot. No form of supervision of these elections, even by their ambassadors, could be obtained by the English-speaking countries. Much of the Yalta Conference was concerned with the Far East. It would be a mistake to regard these discussions as revolving about payments to Soviet Russia in the Far East, in return for its intervention in the war with Japan. All three powers were agreed that Japanese imperialist gains, at the expense of Russia and China since 1854, should be undone, and Stalin was as ready to enter the war against Japan after the defeat of Germany as Roosevelt was eager to have Russia do so. The talk was concerned rather with the terms and details of both of these actions. The first Cairo conference of Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek on December 1, 1943, had agreed to a declaration which promised that Japan will be expelled from all territories which she has taken by violence and greed. At Yalta, this declaration was extended and specified. It was agreed to undo the results of the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 as follows. Southern Sakhalin would be granted to the Soviet Union, along with a lease on the Port Arthur naval base, and a dominant position in the internationalized port of Darin. The Chinese Eastern Railroad and the South Manchurian Railroad, which serves Darin, would be operated jointly by a Soviet-Chinese company in which Soviet interests would be dominant, although full sovereignty over Manchuria would be retained by China. In addition, the Kuril Islands would be ceded to the Soviet Union, and Outer Mongolia, which had been free of Chinese power for decades, would be granted autonomy permanently. These agreements, drawn up in a formal document at Yalta, and specified as the price of Soviet intervention in the war on Japan, were kept secret, although it was admitted that they should be conveyed to Chiang Kai-shek. This could not be done much before the Soviet intervention in the war, because security was so poor in Chongqing that there were no secrets from the Japanese there. Accordingly, the Chinese were not informed of the secret Yalta agreements until President Truman told the Chinese Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. TV Soong, about June 10, 1945. During this period, the great powers were thoroughly disillusioned with China. A generation of almost constant warfare under a government lacking in energy or principles had brought the whole organization to the verge of dissolution. Trade had reached a point of semi-collapse. Inflation was rampant capital of the most fundamental kinds, such as farm tools, roads, and communications, was worn out. Ninety percent of the railroads were out of operation, and the chief concern of almost all Chinese was survival. The existing political division offered little hope of remedying any of China's ills, even after Japan had been defeated. The dominant Kuomintang party was shot through with corruption and complacency, and seemed to have few concerns except remaining in office. Its chief aim seemed to be to maintain its armed blockade of the communist forces operating out of Yan'an, in northwestern China. 
There, the highly disciplined communist armies had taken over the area and appeared to have gained some degree of local support. American hopes of fusing the two parties into a common and energetic Chinese government, however, broke down on the refusals of the Kuomintang and the remoteness of the communists. The Russians seemed to have little interest in these matters, and Stalin made it clear, in his conversations with his Western colleagues, that he had little concern with the situation beyond his rigid determination to secure the specific and strictly limited goals established by his vision of Russian national interests. He had little sympathy for the Chinese communists, or for the Chinese in general, regarded Chiang Kai-shek as the best of a poor lot, and seemed fully prepared to allow the United States to try its own independent hand in working out any agreements it wished in respect to the governing of China. As became clear even in 1944, however, the United States was not going to get its wishes in China, even when it could decide what those wishes were. As early as September 1944, Roosevelt was so completely disillusioned with the Chinese war effort, especially with Cheng's lack of energy in fighting the Japanese, that he suggested that General Stilwell should be given command of all Chinese forces. This demand, sent to Cheng on September 16th, was answered within ten days by a blunt demand from Cheng that Stilwell be removed from China. These circumstances made it inevitable at the time that American leaders, especially the military, should welcome possible intervention of Soviet forces against Japan on the mainland of Asia, and should doubly welcome the addition of the first atomic bombs to their arsenal of weapons. The making of the first atomic bombs is surely the most amazing story of World War II. It is a long, complex, and technical study which most historians would like to omit, but it is not possible to understand the history of the mid-twentieth century without some understanding of how this almost unbelievable weapon was achieved, and especially why the Western powers were able to achieve it, and the fascist powers were not. The gist of this story will be told in the next chapter. Here we need only record that the United States obtained its first three atom bombs over a three-week period from July 15th to August 10th, 1945. The theory on which the nuclear explosions were based was known to the scientists of all countries before April 1939, and the direction in which practical efforts to achieve a bomb must go were established, and equally known before worldwide secrecy descended a year later. In April 1940, just before the fall of France, scientific ignorance, however, was so universal among political and military leaders throughout the world that the use of the existing scientific knowledge would not have been achieved anywhere but for two factors. One, many of the world's greatest nuclear scientists had fled as refugees from fascism to England and the United States. And two, Franklin Roosevelt was quite willing to listen to unconventional suggestions if his attention could be obtained. In the years 1939 to 1941, the refugee scientists in the United States were so fearful that Hitler would obtain the atomic bomb that they were able to prevail upon the best known among them, Einstein, to allow his name to be used to catch Roosevelt's attention. Once this had been done, the urging of these same scientists and the growing urgency of the war itself made it possible for the administrative talents of American scientists to utilize the enormous resources made available to them to reach the goal they sought. After September 1942, Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves, USA, was in charge of the whole project and, in an atmosphere of fanatical secrecy, brought it to a successful conclusion with an expenditure of about two billion dollars and the work of about 150,000 persons. In this, as in other matters, the sudden death of President Roosevelt on April 12, 1945, had a great and incalculable effect. Vice President Truman knew nothing of the atomic research program until he was told of it by Secretary of War Henry Stimson, briefly on April 12th, and at greater length two weeks later. In fact, 
Truman had been kept so far outside the whole war effort that his first few months as president required an almost superhuman effort of absorbed attention to get the major lines of policy into his hands. To avoid a repetition of this situation, in case of his own death, he decided to place James F. Brines, perhaps the most widely experienced man in American government, into the office of Secretary of State, since at that time the incumbent of this first cabinet post was designated as second in line of succession, after the vice president, to the presidency. The new Secretary of State, however, had been serving as assistant president, largely concerned with domestic questions, and he was almost as unfamiliar with the main problems of foreign policy as Truman himself. The problems which Truman, Bryans, and their advisers faced in re-establishing the peace of the world were greatly intensified by the obstructionism of the Soviet government, and by the fact that Winston Churchill had set an election in England, the first in ten years, for July 5, 1945, to renew his government's mandate. The result was not clear until July 27, 1945, because of the need to count absentee ballots from soldiers overseas, but these eventually showed a smashing two-to-one victory of the Labour Party over Churchill's conservatives. Thus, Brines became Secretary of State only on June 30th. He went with President Truman to the Potsdam Conference, which opened on July 17th and lasted until August 2nd. But on July 28, 1945, Clement Attali and Ernest Bevan, the new Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary of Britain, replaced Churchill and Eden as delegates at Potsdam. The transition was made somewhere easier by the fact that Attali had been Deputy Prime Minister since 1942, and had been on the British delegation to Potsdam from the opening of the conference. Nevertheless, the fact that Stalin was the sole survivor of the big three heads of government, who had conferred so often during the war, undoubtedly weakened the West in this last terminal conference. In general, the American delegation seemed to regard as its chief aims to seek to continue the big three cooperation into the post-war world within the structure of the United Nations, whose charter had been adopted at San Francisco on June 25th. The American delegation felt that Europe was falling very rapidly into two antithetical parts, in which Britain would seek to balance a Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe by a British-dominated Western Europe. The Americans wished to avoid this, and particularly to prevent two possible consequences of this, a revival of Germany by Britain to help serve as a shield against Soviet power in the East, and the jeopardizing of Western Europe's and the world's economic revival by the splitting of Europe into opposed blocs. As one evidence of this American attitude, we might mention President Truman's refusal to confer separately with Churchill before the main conference at Potsdam, and his refusal to allow the State Department and the Foreign Office to make any advanced agreement on joint policies. On July 16th, while Truman was surveying the devastation of Berlin, the atomic scientists were gathered on the desolate open plain of Alamo Gordo, New Mexico, 125 miles southeast of Albuquerque. There, an implosion-type plutonium bomb at the top of a steel tower 100 feet high, was detonated at 5.30 a.m. The result was an explosion beyond all expectations, a burst of blinding light far brighter than the sun expanded into a ball of fire two miles high, which lasted second after second, as a great mushrooming pillar of radioactive smoke and dust surging upward to a height of almost eight miles. Almost a minute later, as if the door of a hot oven had been opened, the blast reached base camp, ten miles from the bomb point, with sufficient force to push some people backward. The light was seen 180 miles away by early risers, and the sound, by some freak, split windows at that distance. At the scene, General Thomas F. Farrell said to General Groves, quote, 
the war is over. But the scientists, stricken with horror at their success in releasing a force equivalent to 17,500 tons of TNT from about 12 pounds of plutonium, had had a glimpse of hell. In that instant, many of them became politicians, convinced of the social responsibilities of science, especially to avoid war and to direct the ultimate power of science to human welfare. It was soon established that the steel bomb tower had been volatilized, as was a four-inch iron pipe, 16 feet high, deeply set in concrete, 1,500 feet away. Another 40-ton steel tower, 70 feet high and a half mile away, had been torn to pieces. The first message of the great event in New Mexico reached Secretary of War Stimson at Potsdam on July 17th. It had only three words, babies satisfactorily born. More details followed, and General Grove's detailed account arrived by courier on July 21st. All this information was given to Churchill as it arrived. It was agreed to give the Russians no information, but merely to mention the success of the new bomb as casually as possible, to prevent any later accusations of withholding information when the story became public. The Prime Minister at once saw the significance of the event, but his Chief of Staff, Field Marshal Lord Allenbrook, belittled Churchill's excitement and wrote in his diary, quote, He had absorbed all the minor American exaggerations and, as a result, was completely carried away. It was now no longer necessary for the Russians to come into the Japanese war. The new explosive alone was sufficient to settle the matter. Furthermore, we now had something in our hands which would redress the balance with the Russians. Closed quote. Lord Allenbrook's ignorance, based on his illiteracy in scientific matters, was shared by almost all military men of all armies in the world, and by the overwhelming mass of politicians as well. Among the latter group was Stalin, but fortunately not Truman. The President, on July 18th, ordered the second bomb to be dropped on Japan as soon as it was ready, and on July 24th he chose the list of possible targets. Hiroshima, Kokura, Niigata, and Nagasaki. Secretary Stimson, moved by the tears of Professor Edwin O. Reischauer, and his own memories of the place, persuaded the President to drop from the list Kyoto, a city of temples, shrines, and artistic treasures. These cities were already being spared from B-29 air raids to reserve them for the test of the atom bomb. On this same day, Truman told Stalin of the successful test. There is no doubt that the President, in order to discourage any questions from Stalin, overdid the casualness of his communication. Moreover, he spoke to him aside, using a Russian interpreter whose English was limited. Truman's own account shows that Stalin either did not understand or was ignorant of the fact that an atomic explosion was a significant event. The President wrote, quote, I casually mentioned to Stalin that we had a new weapon of unusual destructive force. The Russian premier showed no special interest. All he said was that he was glad to hear it, and he hoped we would make good use of it against the Japanese. Close quote. It seems likely that Stalin's personal interest in atomic fission in July 1945 was about the same as that of Lord Allenbrook. Although, as we shall see in the next chapter, lesser men in the Soviet system were more aware of the significance of the subject. The atom bomb, thus, seems to have played no role at Potsdam. General Marshall and Secretary Stimson, as well as Churchill, realized that Soviet assistance realized that Soviet assistance was no longer needed to defeat Japan, but no move was made to avoid such intervention. It is, however, extremely likely that the frantic and otherwise inexplicable haste to use the second and third bombs, twenty-one and twenty-four days after Alamogordo, arose from the desire to force a Japanese surrender before an effective Soviet intervention. 
The chief task at Potsdam was to lay the basis for a peace settlement. This was to be worked out in each case by a council of foreign ministers of the Big Three, France and China, using general principles agreed on at Potsdam. These principles were vague and were interpreted or violated subsequently so that, on the whole, the Soviet Union achieved what it wished, east of the Oder River, and Adriatic, and north of Greece, while the Western powers obtained their general desires west and south of these boundaries. As usual, the chief problem was Germany. There the Soviet Union still wanted some kind of partition in order to dominate the fragments, while in the West only France, from continued fear of Germany, sought to fragment and weaken that country, while the English-speaking countries wanted as unified an administration as feasible and a level of economic revival sufficient to make American economic aid unnecessary. In addition, the United States was determined to avoid any repetition of the 1920s, when German reparations had been paid to the other victors from resources borrowed from the United States. The chief principles for post-war Germany, as established at Potsdam, were 1. Permanent and total disarmament and dispersal of all military forces. 2. Complete denazification of public and private life. 3. Nullification of all Nazi discriminatory laws. 4. Punishment of individuals guilty of war crimes and atrocities. 5. Indefinite postponement of any central German government, and thus of any German peace treaty. But maintenance of a central national administrative machine to be used by the Control Council for Economic Activities of National Scope. 6. Decentralization and democratization of political life and of the judicial system. 7. A multi-party system with only Nazi groups forbidden. 8. Democratization and westernization of German education. 9. Establishment of basic Western freedoms of speech, press, religion, and labor union activities. On the economic side, it was agreed that Germany should be treated as a single economic unit, with uniform control measures in all zones, aimed at establishing a consumer-oriented economy under German control, and able to ensure maintenance of occupying forces and refugees, with the standard of living for the Germans themselves no higher than that of non-Russian continental Europe. This somewhat modified version of the Morgenthau scheme which had sought the complete ruralization of German economic life to an agrarian basis, was modified almost at once by a number of factors. The first modifying factor was the desire for reparations. The Americans insisted that reparations must be taken, as far as possible, from existing stocks and plants, rather than from future production, a complete reversal of the American position of 1919. In order to avoid the error of the 1919-1933 period, the overbuilding of German capital equipment and American financing of German reparation payments into the indefinite future. No total and no division of reparation benefits were set, but it was provided that all reparations come from Germany as a whole and be credited to the victors on a percentage basis. To administer this, to escape from Polish reparation claims, and to get the Russians out of the Italian question, so that that country could become a partner of the Western powers, Secretary Brines worked out a complicated deal. The central basis for this deal was that Germany had an industrialized West and an agricultural East. The Soviet Union wanted reparations from the industrial plants of the West, while the United States and Britain wanted agricultural products, not reparations, from eastern Germany to feed the western Germans and the millions of German refugees and repatriates who were pouring westward from all communist-dominated areas of the east and from the lands lost to Poles, Czechs, and others 
In simple terms, Brine's compromise was that each country take reparations from its own zone, but that Russia would get 40% of the heavy war industrial equipment of Western Germany, for which it would pay for only 25% in food, coal, and other basic needs from the East. From this total, the Soviet Union would pay the reparation claims of Poland, release Italy from all Russian reparation claims, and agree to the immediate admission of Italy into the United Nations. One of the critical events of this period was the Soviet refusal to supply food or coal to the areas of Berlin occupied by the democratic powers. This and the millions of Germans streaming westward to seek refuge beyond the reach of vengeful Russians, Poles, and Czechs played a great role in arousing sympathy for Germans in the West and in establishing a common front of cooperative work and mutual dependence in that area. On July 26, 1945, Truman, Adlai, and Chiang Kai-shek issued an ambiguous ultimatum to Japan warning the latter that it must accept immediate unconditional surrender or suffer complete and utter destruction. This was regarded by the three leaders as a threat of atomic holocaust unless Japan laid down its arms. But the atomic threat was unspecified and, to the Japanese, meaningless, while their chief concern, whether unconditional surrender meant removal of the emperor, was equally unspecified. The Japanese premier, Admiral Kentaro Suzuki, who had been put into office to find a way out of the war, was caught in a trap. If he made any serious effort to surrender, he could be murdered by the militarists, while his secret efforts had been rebuffed by the West as too vague. To ward off the former, he made a public statement that the Potsdam Declaration was unworthy of notice. On July 26th, the heavy cruiser, Indianapolis, top-heavy with new anti-aircraft and radar equipment and still unequipped with underwater submarine detection devices, unloaded the bomb without its last essential part of uranium-235 on Tinian. It put to sea at once, and, in the night of July 29th, between Guam and Leyte, was practically blown apart by torpedoes from Japanese submarine I-58. In fourteen minutes, with all communications knocked out, the great ship rolled over and dived to the bottom. One-third of her 1,200 men were already dead. The rest were left struggling in the water. Four days passed without anyone in the American armed forces asking a question about the Indianapolis. Then an American plane spotted survivors in a large oil patch. 316 were picked up in the next few days, but the bomb was safe on Tinian. While the I-58 was stalking the Indianapolis in the Pacific, the heavy cruiser, Augusta, was in mid-Atlantic, bringing President Truman and his assistants back from Potsdam. From mid-ocean, the President sent the signal to Washington and Tinian to drop the bomb on Japan. By August 5th, all was ready and at 2.45 a.m. the following morning, the modified B-29 Enola Gay, Colonel Paul W. Tibbets, Jr., in command, went roaring down the long Tinian runway on its seven-hour flight to Hiroshima. Only one man aboard, a scientist commissioned as a Navy captain, William S. Parsons, knew exactly what the strange new bomb was or why Colonel Tibbets had been given such unorthodox orders regarding bombing technique. These orders were to dive for maximum speed and turn 150 degrees the moment the bomb was released. Parsons directly violated his orders to arm the bomb before it was loaded in the plane because he had seen several B-29s en route to Japan crash on takeoff and he realized that an atomic accident might destroy Tinian Airfield with its hundreds of million-dollar planes and its tens of thousands of trained men. Just before takeoff, Captain Parsons borrowed a loaded revolver to use on himself if the Enola Gay landed in Japanese territory. 
Six and a half hours later, 1,700 miles north of Tinian, the Enola Gay came in sight of its target. The doomed city lay quiet in flooding early morning sunshine. At 9.15, precisely on schedule, the giant plane went into its bombing run at 31,600 feet, speed 328 miles per hour. As the bomb was released, the plane twisted violently away to get as far as possible from the blast. Seconds ticked off as the bomb fell almost five miles to 2,000 feet. Then the two masses of uranium came together at lightning speed and turned to energy. The fireball expanded outward, enveloping the center of the city, its intense heat and blast driving outward to shatter buildings and ignite the debris. Fifteen miles away, the Enola Gay was slapped twice by the concussion. An hour and a half later, from 360 miles away, the crew could look back and still see the mushroom cloud rearing up to 40,000 feet. Under that cloud, at least 40,000 Japanese were killed instantly. An additional 12,000 died in the next few days, and eventually 60,175 perished, with an equal number injured. The city was over half destroyed, with the area of devastation extending out a mile from ground zero. News of this great disaster was released at once in Washington, but in Japan, communications were disrupted, and there was no agreement on what had happened. The Emperor sent word to Premier Suzuki to accept the Potsdam Declaration, but the militarists insisted on three conditions. One, Japan would disarm its own troops. Two, the occupation of Japan would be limited. And three, war criminals would be tried by Japanese courts. All assumed that the Emperor's position was beyond discussion. The stalemate continued as the Soviet Union declared war on Japan late on August 8th. The Japanese Supreme War Council remained deadlocked day after day in spite of a second plutonium bomb dropped on Nagasaki with about 100,000 casualties, of which one-third were dead. August 9th, 1945 Early on the morning of August 10th, when the War Council had been in continuous session for 16 hours, Emperor Hirohito personally ordered it to make peace. A message accepting the Potsdam terms, with reservation of the Emperor's position, was sent the same day. This was accepted by an American note which provided that the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, SCAP, would issue orders to the Emperor and Government of Japan. A military coup was attempted in Japan, but was suppressed on August 15th. Seven Japanese generals and admirals committed harikari. The Emperor then, for the first time in history, spoke on the radio, asking his people to accept the peace. Many listeners expected him to ask them to fight to the death. All were stunned and remained in this strange condition for weeks. They had been so misled by their own propaganda that many had believed they were about to win the war. A ceasefire was issued late on August 16th. On September 2nd, the final surrender was signed on the deck of the battleship Missouri, in the shadow of the great 16-inch guns, and under the 31-star flag which Perry had flown at the same anchorage 92 years before. Thus ended six years of world war in which 70 million men had been mobilized and 17 million killed in battle. At least 18 million civilians had been killed. The Soviet Union and Germany had lost most heavily. The former had 6.1 million soldiers killed and 14 million wounded, but lost over 10 million civilian dead. Germany lost 6.6 .6 million servicemen killed or dead in service, with 7.2 million wounded and 1.3 million missing. Japan's armed forces had 1.9 million dead. Britain's war dead were 357,000, while America's were 294,000.
all this personal tragedy and material damage of untold billions of dollars was needed to demonstrate to the irrational minds of the Nazis, fascists, and Japanese militarists that the Western powers and the Soviet Union were stronger than the three aggressor states, and, accordingly, that Germany could not establish a Nazi continental bloc in Europe, nor could Japan dominate an East Asian co-prosperity sphere. This is the chief function of war, to demonstrate as conclusively as possible to mistaken minds that they are mistaken in regard to power relationships. But, as we shall see, in demonstrating these objective facts in order to change mistaken subjective pictures of these facts, war also changes most drastically the objective facts themselves.